Hello and welcome to the European Centre of Total Quality Management. The Centre has always had a tradition of uh, organising innovative products and initiatives to help industry absorb uh, new ideas and practices which are proven and which are based on world-class standards. We decided to launch an initiative by the name of Excellence 001 which is aimed at industries of all sizes and covering different sectors. The aim of Excellence 001 is really to um, convince senior managers that in the pursuit of excellence and raising competitive standards, they have to use an integrative, holistic, rigorous, continuous uh, set of programs and initiatives to serve their uh, corporate strategies and to deliver value to their customers and stakeholders. The proposition that we're making therefore through this initiative is that excellence resides in the spirit of um, using all the drivers, all the capabilities at the disposal of any organization and particularly those that will deliver continuous and sustainable value to the customers and benefits to the organization. And the premise that we make through this series is that there are pillars of success that organizations need to focus on and pay attention to if they wish to become excellent. This session concerns itself with the application of modern management principles wider than the traditionally manufacturing based um, sectors and for example in the public sector there are loads of best practices and we want to demonstrate that the public sector can tremendously benefit from uh, using modern management principles. I hope you enjoy uh, this series that we put together for you and I hope that uh, you will manage uh, to absorb the principle itself uh, to derive some uh, uh, ideas and benefits from these first-hand best practice experiences that we've compiled together. And more importantly, I hope that these ideas can serve the purpose of assisting you in putting together improvement action plans and hopefully in the pursuit of excellence in your organizations. We all depend on the public sector and if we, if we stop to think about the value of the public sector to society, to ourselves, to our families, we would realize that uh, uh, there is no nation that can function without its public sector. Uh, it is therefore significant. The exciting thing is that the public sector now has closed the gap uh, in terms of um, how organizations are run, how they function, and, and basically in terms of best practices. I mean, I think I remember the days when uh, uh, knowledge and uh, creation was the privilege of the private sector and uh, many sectors, many aspects of the pri public sector were a laughing stock, you know, we, uh, we look at them from a cynical perspective and uh, 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 we don't appreciate what, what they do and I think that that is changing, there is a revolution going out there um, and, uh, and, and I think Ken tonight will tell us some of the aspects that are truly revolutionizing the public sector and therefore creating a, a very exciting time for all of us uh, to see that uh, you know the theme is about the customer and the theme is about rendering value uh, to communities to society and to ourselves as, as individual and I think uh, hopefully in the next few years we will cease to uh, differentiate between the public sector and the private sector enterprise or mentality if you like because uh, as I said the um, the gap is closing very fast. I'm not an expert on public sector management, that's why I've invited my colleague Ken uh, and, and Barbara will be around for the, uh, the mingling, if you like, uh, following on from the session. So you have the chance to talk to them and ask them questions and, and find out a little bit more. So I'm very pleased to have them here uh, to tell us from, uh, if you like, their own experiences and the expertise that they have in the field. And, and because of that, I just want 
to make one statement about the public sector. This is something I picked from the internet. Uh, Ken might be uh, to tell me, well, Mohammed is already outdated. But uh, I think the message from my perspective is that the, the, the government's goals, as far as the public center, uh, sector is concerned, is to render value, is to make services accessible, first of all, to people, but also to make sure that those services are delivered sensitively with quality, with efficiency, with effectiveness, whether in a timely and innovative manner. That's what it is about. So it is a theme that is uh, putting the customer first. It is about giving us choice as uh, consumers uh, of those services. It is about modernization. Public sector is about uh, using those technologies, about access to the internet. It is about doing things from the comfort of your home. And why not? It is about accountability, value for money. It is about best value. It is about competitiveness, about market testing, it is about those things. And I think the thing that also excites me is that the public sector is about partnership. I mean, we hear about the importance of the private sector in the healthcare service, for example, building hospitals, or in the education sector, for example, running facilities, running schools. And I think that is healthy. And, and the vice versa, I would like to see one day that the public sector is offering services to the private sector. Maybe it's already happening, and maybe Ken will have the chance to shed some light on this. It's about resource consumption. We all are servants. You know, in society we all rent the value and therefore we are accountable for the resources that we use which are at our disposal. And lastly, I think it is about innovation. You know, the service as a consumable thing get, becomes uh, stale, becomes boring. And we must really uh, keep replenishing the needs of society, of communities, by ensuring that the, we completely go back, if you like, to the drawing table and innovate. And innovation is a theme uh, which will grow in the public se sector as well. And of course, out of uh, innovation is improvement uh, and um, is excellence and so on and so forth. So that's where I would like to stop as far as my own individual perspective of the public sector. What I'd like to do is uh, share with you a case study of an organization which is probably uh, a, a hybrid organization, you know, uh, the post office now called uh, Consania uh, is uh, public, uh, publicly owned but uh, maybe operates in a spirit which is private sector oriented. That is entirely up to you. But from my perspective today, uh, that is a case study that um, I have been associated with and I would like to present it to you today. Um, and, and as a background, I think uh, we need to register the change in the name uh, and uh, rest assured that uh, the post office uh, is still the post office, although we call it consignia. Uh, it is for these reasons. Uh, I think the top management uh, and leaders of the post office have realized uh, that uh, if you like, since their incorporation as a, a, a government-owned public company, uh, they have now the chance to uh, uh, rebuild themselves and they have the freedom to invest in this business and going for joint ventures, uh, acquire businesses and expand internationally. And I think that what they wanted to do is use this as a platform to relaunch themselves uh, to determine their future by rising to the challenge, but also by competing internationally. That is the reason why they've changed the name. And um, uh, if you like, this is the prediction. Uh, they think that their market is about distribution of letters, of parcels, whatever it is, and they reckon that the growth in the market over the next 10 years is going to you know, grow by about 60%, 120%, sorry, 20 billion to 57 billion, and they want to a chunk of that. So the brand name is very important in that, that sense because it, it, it is a way of, uh, if you like, uh, internationalizing what they do, and it is to give them distinctiveness with the business ethos that they have and the identification not just with the UK based customers but with international customers. That's the background basically. And I think that, th that this is a nice statement from them. They said the, the name give, g gives us a standing from our competitors, particularly internationally. It will enable us to position ourselves in modern integrated distribution company uh, provided tailored and global business solutions. Very nice language, but why not? The post office existed for a very long time 
but they want to keep uh, reinventing themselves to serve the needs of a modern uh, business community, international business community. What I'm interested in is the Post Office Counters Limited, uh, who are a subsidiary of the Post Office, wholly owned. Um, it is an organization that all of us, again, use on an everyday basis. We buy a stamp, we bank in our money, we draw money, uh, whatever it is. We retail, we buy uh, envelopes and stuff like that. They have 170 different types of transactions, and they deal with something like 28 million customers weekly. They handle a lot of cash, and that's why that machine is churning out money. 127 billion of cash uh, every year, and their turnover is 1.17 billion pounds. And these figures are old. Forgive me, I didn't have time to look at the most update one. But that's not the reason for uh, not talking about them. Their mission is to run the UK's large retail chain. Uh, uh, that might change with time, with a new change in the name. Um, they offer, as I said, a distinctive range of services uh, to uh, us as individuals, but also to corporate customers. And um, uh, if you just bear with me, I will tell you the kind of customers that they deal with. People like ourselves, but also clients like Benefits Agency, DVLA, B B British Telecom, Gyrobank, Royal Mail, and so on and so forth. So they have uh, corporate customers and uh, members of the public like ourselves. These are out of the 120 uh, 70 transactions that the post office deal with uh, these are the kind of processes uh, where the transactions come from. Mails, uh, telecommunication, lotteries, other retail uh, stationaries, uh, paying bills, buying your insurance from the post office, opening a saving account with them, banking your money, um, you know, etc, etc. So they offer a wide range of services to all of us. They employ a lot of people, over 12,000 people. They are positioned in seven geographical regions. They have nearly 20,000 offices. 600 of those are owned uh, by the post office counters uh, itself, and the rest are franchises or sub-post offices. Okay, that's in terms of background. What I want to talk to you about now is really quality service provision within uh, the Post Office Counters Limited. Um, I think you know it may surprise some of you, but they were one of the first pioneers with quality in the UK because. Total quality management in the UK was not evident until the uh, late 80s, and they were one of the f very first pioneers. Because at that time, they launched something called Customer First Program, which had a lot of undertakings and a lot of, if like, of uh, uh, charters and commitment. Basically, rendering better service, working more efficiently, creating relationships with customers, uh, being more professional in what they do, and uh, very, very exciting language in those years. And they continued that journey. They didn't stop. They, it wasn't a fad for them. It was part and parcel of modernization and building a culture of service provision. And now they're using the excellence model, and maybe Ken will refer to it. Uh, with the, the aspiration for being excellent and as a vehicle for driving their strategies and inducing change programs to remain competitive. The case study is about a project called the Customer Advisor Project. Now, this is, uh, uh, this is a project w which was launched a few years ago to improve service uh, in the retail outlets that they have. And they wanted to improve the service at no additional cost to us as customers. How can we make it more pleasant? How can we make it more uh, efficient? How do we get rid of queues? And the queues thing is very important here. So where do we start from? Where are we now? We must start by documenting our processes. So we must map those processes. And we want to learn from the best. Now. They went and looked at uh, the retail sector. They looked at, um, uh, I think, Sainsbury's. They were not very impressed. They went to a couple of banks. Uh, they were not very impressed. And uh, they, uh, they started to look abroad. You know, are there any additional uh, uh, identical partners uh, to us that we could learn from? 
in terms of ser providing service excellence. So they used the benchmarking methodology which guided them towards being ready uh, for uh, driving that project. And these are the steps. Identify the partners, carry out the data analysis, do the visits, uh, what are the learnings, the best practices, how to implement them, and lastly, how do you make those new ideas, fresh ideas, part and parcel of the culture of the organization. That's the process. And there is a documented methodology which they have adapted basically using their own individual language. Now the surprising thing, um, th this is the process basically when they documented it. It looked very uh, complex, very cumbersome. It really was uh, um, if you like a high level process map rather than something that can be used as a chunk which is uh, benchmarkable yeah uh, and I'm not going to go through that detail um, you know that was complex so they narrowed it to this process here which is about the queues and those of you who used to visit the post office on a frequent basis, the biggest irritation was queues, wasn't it? You take a lunch, lunchtime break to go and post a letter or buy a stamp, and guess what? You, you, will, you, know, you miss out on your lunch because the queue was too long. How many of us in this room have experienced that? Okay, I mean, uh, as I said, now it's uh, this... Uh, uh, this principle of uh, the mountain cannot come to Mohammed, Mohammed has to go to the mountain, is well practiced. Uh, you see it in the airlines, when you go for check-in, people come and try to streamline and move the queues forward by helping you and making sure you're ready. Uh, I mean, if you go to America, because uh, in immigration, for example, they come and check you out while, so that you know, the queues move fast. Burger King, um, people come and take your order while you're in the queue. So I think it has caught on, but it's a simple aspect because what they've done, they tackled the queuing uh, management uh, system uh, because from surveying the customers, this is the biggest irritation factor that we all had to endure for a long time to come. Is so, well, uh, I, I think they were implementing it region by region. So, uh, I mean, I think what they're trying to do now is, uh, is, uh, is continue with that drive. That was a pilot. That was really immediately after they've learned from America. So, I'm, I'm going to ask you that question at the end. But nonetheless, what I would like uh, to say is that this customer advisor, the, uh, as the Americans called it, the lobby director program, has actually led to a lot of benefits. Um, uh, people complain less uh, because their problems are dealt with because the customer and focus on the customer is the most important thing. Um, the queues have been reduced and 53% uh, decrease in complaints because of queues. 62% um, increase in compliments so staff are more helpful and therefore they're getting the rewards because people recognize that. Um, the uh, service provision is much faster because it's more streamlined. You know precisely what you're coming for, you know precisely where you need to go to. Um, and the politeness thing, the professionalism. So I think that it's a simple program, but you can see the benefits that it has led to. Um, I think uh, what I wanted to say is that programs such as this would not have succeeded within the post office uh, uh, unless they uh, have, because they have committed to quality in the early stages. So I'm more interested in that growth curve, if you like, the, the actual, the green one. Um, and those are the figures I have. Um, uh, you know, you may tell me otherwise, but uh, forgive me, that's the trend I have, which is a little bit dated, I know. But it tells you that with quality, with quality maturity, you become more daring because you start to recognize more and more that the customer comes first. And then you set ambitious targets, but you, the, the, the delivery, if it is process driven, if it is customer focused, is going to meet those targets time and time again. And being brave to measure because, uh, uh, you know, this way of measuring independently, objectively, uh, how the customer feels about the service they're receiving uh, is the most gratifying thing because that's their, they are saying it, it's not you trying to give yourselves a pat on the shoulder. Um, other things is benchmarking and again they benchmarked themselves 
with the competitors like banks, building societies, W.A. Smith, Boots, and the sub post offices, the franchises. And again, you can see, I'm interested in the green peaks there. You can see a trend, a positive trend. It's not the benchmark. You know, they're not saying we're better than banks or building societies, but they are saying that we're closing that gap. We're improving on a regular basis. And I think that needs to be applauded because that is the sustainability thing that you want to generate because there is commitment to the customer and commitment to quality. They are also using uh, the excellence model, as I said, and their scores are improving uh, significantly. Obviously, uh, I think now they are around 600 points. It's very difficult to get 700 points plus because that's world class, that's award-winning score. But nonetheless, these scores are a demonstration of that commitment and, uh, if you like, the quality that they put in place. So, the question, as you said, is, have you seen any queues at the post office lately? Yes. So, um, uh, you, you know, I just wanted basically to do this prelude uh, to Ken's session uh, because the public sector can rise to the challenge. And I think here's an organization that has taken a very simple challenge, uh, trying to listen to the customer, trying to do something about it. Uh, it may take a long time to see the perfect post office or the perfect uh, service provision post offices. But nonetheless, uh, I think those of us who have been following them over the years have noticed significant changes and those changes need to be applauded. They're not perfect, but they're on their way to become better. All right, so on this note... I hope you have enjoyed the session. And indeed, I hope you have managed to derive some key lessons and perhaps some prompts from the conceptual side of uh, adopting excellence and from the application that uh, you have just witnessed. Thank you.